G'day, Internet. And we're back with another episode of Improving Your Secure, secure Code with Your Skills. And this time we'll look at some authentication bugs. One of the classes of authentication bugs that is common is logic bugs or logic flaws. And it's a rather poorly defined um, category of, of bugs. Typically, I would say it's anything where the software is using, using logic analysis, you know, such as testing a Boolean to make a decision. And there's a flaw in that analysis that was, will allow an attacker to alter the outcome or the expected outcome. But it's not necessarily the only way. Um, you might argue that all vulnerabilities are logic flaws in that the developer might not have been thinking logically or applied logic in the right way when they wrote the code. Um, however, I, would, I, I tend to view it as a more narrow approach. Um, so keep that in mind, I guess, as, as we look through um, some of the examples here. And as usual, <clears throat> I'll be looking at PHP, but um, most of this should be applicable to other languages as well. Um, at least several of the bug classes are not unique to PHP. So one of the most common ones that you'll find both in PHP and other languages is the use of uh, redirects to prevent uh, unauthenticated access. So if you're not logged in, it will redirect to login. So here's a very uh, basic example of this. We have a, a controller, it handles a request and does a, a switch statement based on the, the action parameter to the page. Uh, and we see the first case here is adding a user. It doesn't include file and then checks if the server side session has a login value assigned. If it does not have a login value assigned, it will redirect to the login page so that you can log in. And one of the key parts of that is this redirection or sending of the header, it does not stop execution. So while your browser might be redirected to the login page, the subsequent code, which is this section here, will still run until it hits this break statement. So we go here, we check, yes, are you authenticated? No, in which case redirect the browser. And then immediately after it sends that header, it continue processing the insertion of a user. Now it's possible that the actual function to insert a user has additional checks and that this wouldn't, uh, wouldn't necessarily allow an authenticated user to add a user. Um, further analysis is required, but on the surface, this looks like a vulnerability. Um, I'm not gonna do the full triage, but the, the use of a header without an immediate Fault of execution is a pattern, and it's a pattern that's applicable to a lot of languages. And it's one of the most common forms of authentication bypass, um, at least in things that aren't using frameworks. So once you have an application that uses, say, Laravel or um, Code Igniter, et cetera, then the way you handle authentication and routing is, is obviously different. Um, but for this type of um, I'll say explicitly uh, ASP Classic, JSP, PHP, um, C JavaScript, obviously, anything where the page or the file that's, that's running the, the server side page uh, is making the decisions rather than relying on a, a framework, you'll find this type of vulnerability. Um, I guess I should also add that one of the great parts of um, authentication code and, and logic flaws is that you don't rely on tooling. You, you read the code, you find where authentication is defined, 
and you you go and you read the code. And because the code um, tend to be centralized in the one authentication place, you just read it top to bottom um, and you look for places where uh, this type of problem exists. Right, so let's look at another example here. In this case, we'll just start reading the, the code top to bottom. The first function we have is login submit. Uh, it does a, a check user and sets a session that looks pretty standard. Function get user relies on a cookie value. That's attacker control. So that's that's a code smell where a function to the, the get user call will return a, a user controlled value, which means that the user name is subject to the user's decision. Um, then we have a, a function for checking cookies. Uh, it checks if the user value is set in cookie, instantiates uh, a class or the user class, and then attempts to find the username. Checks if the presumably database row for that user uh, has an authentication value of 100, then it's an admin. Um, and if these, if the user exists and it has an authentication value or an auth value of 100, um, it defines a login, username is from the cookie, and admin value is from the database. So the problem with this function is if this check cookie is used um, for authentication, which it seems like it does, um, then the attacker can become any user. The attacker just sets the value of a username that's valid, and the admin status of that user will be determined by whether or not that user is an admin. But there is no second factor, there's no password, there's, there's nothing else. It's just if check cookie determines the login data, as the cross reference seems to suggest. Actually, go to this one. Then, so here we have an index page. It opens an authentication object and then checks the cookie and that is the login data. Um, so yes, um, login as any user, but simply cha changing the username uh, in your cookie. Obviously, I have another line highlighted here that was <laughs> really intentional. Um, the logout is fine. It just unsets the session. Um, also, the check user, there's a couple of problems here. The first one is obviously use of MD5. It's no longer considered safe. That's too old, um, vulnerable to collisions. Uh, it also appears to not use uh, password sorting and uh, various other problems. So password handling. Password handling is difficult, probably deserves its own chapter. Um, but the other thing that's important here is the, uh, the use of the double equal comparison. And let me actually just load this up in a second. I'm just gonna start up. Um, the, uh, the instance Start a new, Start a new. Okay. Uh, and so the the problem with the double equal 
is that PHP does something called type juggling, and you can find that elsewhere as well. It is not just a uh, sorry. It's not just a PHP thing. Um, but <clears throat> because of the way that um, hexadecimal values work, um, you might find a hash that starts with 0e e or 00e. Zero, zero e. I make that an uppercase, I think. Um, it will type juggle that to a uh, float. So if we just do a simple test code and run this. You see that the string 0e01 equals the string 00e12. Um, and obviously that shouldn't happen. If we do a triple equal, the triple equal, it should do type-based comparison and not juggle. And that should prevent this from working. back to a double equal, plugged in. Um, and so because we're comparing hashes, there's always a chance that the hash, we the password we submitted results in a hash that starts with zero E and the hash we're comparing against starts with zero E. I think it actually has to be zero E and a number um, to, to trigger that float comparison. So even though both sides of the comparison is a string, it gets type juggled and you can make a password that doesn't match, match. Um, and so whenever you see double equals, at least in PHP, in uh, authentication checks, it's a problem. There's a secondary problem and that is string comparison. Um, well, in this case, it gets juggled, but overall string comparison is time-based. And so it's possible to do Oracle padding attacks, um, not, Again, going into that, um, but PHP has a, a time safe password or hash comparison function, um, and your language may also have that, um, and so you should be using a time safe comparison uh, function for comparing hashes, not just string based comparison. So this one again, it's one one class, not too many lines. Uh, 83 lines of code. Uh, so we've identified a code smell, we identified type juggling, bad password hashing, um, authentication bypass or privilege escalation, I guess you could say to set the, probably both, to set the, the username of the cookie. Um, no tools required, just, just read the code top to bottom. Let's keep digging. <laughs> Um, um, this, one. this one I like. This this is what I would consider a true logic flaw in in that the the boolean value that we're comparing um, is is wrong. So let's just read this from the top. Um, it checks if if login is one. Uh, and if admin one, if we don't have those, so let's just assume that we haven't, we don't have anything previously submitted, we'll end up in this else statement. Uh, it checks if post log user submit is, has a value. That's fine, we can do that. Let's assume the database connection exists. And then it takes the log user from the post request, the log password from the post request, defines two SQL statements. Select username from Usaria, which is Spanish, Brazilian, uh, for users, where username equals log user. Now, let's ignore the SQL injection here. Let's just assume that this was a database safe query. Um, then secondary does a select password from users where password um, equals log. It's an interesting mix of, of, of English and uh, Hispanic here, 
<coughs> then it does two data queries. It gets the user that matches the username and it gets the password that matches the password. Next it does, <coughs> if the number of rows with that username is greater than zero and the number of rows for that password is greater than zero, uh, then again, it selects the data from the users where username is users with duplicating the effort um, and then sets a cookie. And again, the cookie I would argue is not particularly safe. It has the user and username um, and login value of one. So um, again, cookie handling. But the thing that I think is greatest with this is if you haven't spotted it already, I'm, I'm going to reveal it to you now. The fact that it does two separate SQL queries. So one will contain a username. So let's say that you have a user. And we'll write it out here, uh, actually. See, if you had a database uh, that consisted of something like this, uh, two users, the first one is admin. Uh, and the admin has a very strong password. You're not going to guess that. Uh, and then it has guest, and the guest has a very basic password, which is guest. Uh, we're going to copy these database queries in here. Um, and we'll just start. Filling it out, and we'll see if if the problem pops out uh, as you watch me do this. Maybe you've spotted it now. Let me skip the query. So, if the number of rows where the username is admin is greater than zero. Well, yes, we have one. And the number of rows where the password is greater than zero and password guess, yes, we have one row of those. So the password comes from the guest, call of a guest row and the user data comes from the admin row. Then we have authenticate because it's not tying the username to uh, the username password combination to the same row. Uh, and so uh, any valid username with any valid password will log you in as that username, uh, which is, um, per my definition, this is, a, this is a true logic flaw bug. Um, but again, there is no pure definition. It's all, it's all rather fuzzy. Um, but it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting authentication uh, flaw in terms of the the logic applied for authentication. Uh, never mind the fact that there is a SQL injection and you could probably just manipulate the cookie as well. So um, that aside, I just wanted to highlight the logic portion of this. <clears throat> One of the other very common approaches, obviously this is a this is a real bug, it's it's a patched one, is that when you have a set of administrative Functions. So you see here we're looking at PHP IPAM, which is an IP management software. It has an admin directory, and under admin directory, it has an import export, and there's a lot of import and export files in here that does various imports and exports. Uh, and the way these work is at the very top of the file, uh, it initializes the required objects. And so the user object will develop that. that it's a logged in user, the admin object will validate that it's an ad, logged in admin. Um, and then it also has, uh, I guess, these things here. And so this could potentially be a problem because we see checks that there's a valid user session, but it doesn't necessarily check that there's a valid admin session. Um, this is implied. So if, if you dig deeper, you'll find that the, the admin class will check that there's a valid admin session. So as long as you include the admin class, here uh, and there's a valid user session. It should be a valid admin user session. Uh, and so there is 
a code clarity concern here potentially in that you can't tell necessarily whether or not admin uh, is being applied or not. That aside, what sometimes happens is when people are copy pasting um, or reusing code, they might forget to add the admin flag or even the user check. And then suddenly within these 50 files within the admin input export, there are a couple of files that have the wrong privilege. And we can see this here in the uh, generate host. Uh, it has it has the admin value in here. If we go back to let me see, let me just hit the history. Oh, sorry, I want to make the actual diff. So the only change to this file was to add this object, which then enforces the admin check. So in versions prior to this commit, um, any authenticated user, because it still verifies that the user is logged in. So a normal user could export. Um, and this one is particularly interesting. You could dump uh, the database as an authenticated user by accessing the admin URL directly. And so again, that's that's another um, common flaw. And it's a case of learning how the checks are implemented, where they're implemented, and recognizing that pattern. And then you can basically just go through file by file by file by file by file. Does it have the admin object defined? No, this one didn't. Okay. Does it actually do anything that's useful? Yes, okay. Well, now you have a vulnerability such as I can export MySQL dumps. Um, and there are, I, I use grep usually for this, where I'll, I'll grep, I'll generate one list of all of the files, then I'll generate a list of all of the files that has the admin in, and then I'll grep sort of the diff to all the files that are not in the admin section, other ones I want to look at. Um, okay, moving on. For our next one, we're going to look at um, Knights of Nine X, uh, very funny advisory. I picked this one because I didn't want to go looking uh, for a logic slash authentication flaw in uh, in Python. Um, I did want to cover some other languages besides PHP, uh, and this saves me from having to, to dig through the, the code to find one. So in this case, we're working backwards. Um, so we have social fish, so I've opened this one here. Uh, I did have to check out the, the previous uh, revision. So this isn't, this isn't running on main or master, it's running on a specific revision to make sure that the vulnerability is present, obviously. Um, working backwards from this, we see that the uh, the exploit defines uh, a bind shell, defines a URL, and the payload is the URL plus the shell. So uh, this looks like straight up command injection. In this case, we see the first request hits uh, configure. So if we look at social fish, So they can type. Uh, no, it's the API call. No, so route configure, and there doesn't appear to be an authentication check here. It just takes the input from the request. So if status is clone, which I believe is what we have here. Uh, status clone, yep. Yeah. If status is clone, URL comes from the request form. Um, and that's that's it. It doesn't do anything else. 
Um, presumably, you would imagine that configuring the software should require authentication, but in this case, this this just not checked. Um, it also doesn't do anything with with the uh, with the data. It just sets up a variable, um, and then. The next one, it just does a, a get request to the root. So what's the route for the default? Um, status is clone, it will call clone on the URL, which comes from here, which then calls our system wget on the URL. So that's where the command injection comes in from the OS system. So this is what we would call a second order um, flow where the data is safely handled at this point uh, and then code execution occurs at this point. So it's the second order. Um, or you might call it an indirect. Um, but the thing that allows this to occur is the fact that the configure endpoint does not have authentication uh, requirements. So anyone should be uh, able to, to configure the phishing side. So it's, I'd argue it's, an, it's a mix. It's both an authentication bypass and a second order command injection. Um, one of my old bugs, um, <clears throat> It's in a similar a similar vein. Um, so Vega DNS has a bunch of files in it. Most of them lives under sort of source and requires authentication. But in the web route, there is this AXFR tool. This one does not require authentication. Uh, you supply the host name. Uh, or domain, and then uh, it defines the host name as so the domain and the host name from there creates a, a temporary file based on the uh, escape shell command of the domain. Then runs command, then escape shell command host name, escape shell command domain, and uh, the file. Now, I'm not mistaken, this used to be a little different. Uh, yep. So, in, let me just view this one. In the version when it was vulnerable, Oops, sorry. Uh, I could go one further back. So in this version, um, the file name contains the domain, which comes from the request, no escaping. And then in the command that it's running, um, the running escape shell command, arguably that should be escape shell args because it's not the command, it's an argument to the command. Um, <clears throat> so we wanna make sure that we use the uh, appropriate one for that. Domain is escaped here, but what is, uh, potentially arguably a logic flaw is that the domain was also applied to file and file name is used here uh, unescaped. And so you have a command injection. And that's the one file in, in the whole project that doesn't require authentication checks. So it's arguably not an authentication bypass, but it is a, a pre-auth vulnerability, whereas all the other vulnerabilities I looked at at the time, they were all 
power stored. So that makes this vulnerability valuable. And lastly, uh, let's just quickly look at some uh, crypto stuff. So this one um, is probably the most PHP specific, uh, and that's the uh, there's a function from uh, a cyber alarm thing. Um, ultimately, this is what it boils down to. When they're generating a hash, they put a salt in front, they put your password in the middle, and a pepper at the end. And this phash function takes their, so, I mean, first of all, salts are supposed to be unique. They should not be a hard-coded string. Pepper could arguably be a fixed string, um, but salts should definitely be unique. So that's a problem in itself there. But it gets more interesting, and that is this phash function that they use to handle the salt will generate a SHA-256 hash and return it. Uh, that's also problematic for other reasons, such as um, entropy versus string length. Um, I think it also might enable key length extension attacks. I'm not a cryptographer. I could be wrong on this one. But the, the bit that is, I guess, a bit of a bit of a logical uh, flaw here is, is this. So if we look at the uh, password hash function from PHP, if you're using password decrypt, the algorithm, the password parameter is truncated to a maximum length of 72 bytes. And so what we have here is we have the whole, the first portion of the function argument is the password. And in this case, it's one hash concatenated with the password concatenated with another hash. Now, 264, so 256 ha bits hash is 64 characters. Um, so you have a total of 72 in total, take away 64, but that leaves eight characters for the password. So even if users set a stronger password than eight characters, it gets truncated. And since we know, um, well, cracking it would be kind of trivial because you know what the, the hard coded salt is, but even if you didn't, brute force is also viable because it's fixed at eight. And it's just this logic of um, not understanding the truncation, choosing to use a hash for the salt rather than a, a unique string that's shorter. Um, we have ended up in a problem. And this isn't unique to, um, to this one. The, it, if you dig down in the comments, there's another one here. This one comes from uh, PrestaShop. Uh, where uh, bcrypt is truncating. And if we look at the actual files changed, Um, they had a similar similar problem in that they're prefixing cookie key to the password using bcrypt. Um, yeah, so um, those are just uh, a few quick examples. Um, but really just wanted to highlight that um, there's no need for particular tools or anything. You just when you're looking at authentication, it's usually best to read the code top to bottom and just being aware of a lot of language specific issues. Um, and just, you know, pay close attention to the logic that's being used. All right, thank you. And I'll see you at the next one. If you have any, uh, any comments, suggestion, feedback, uh, just yeah, leave a comment on YouTube and uh, see you later.